I'm pleased to introduce today's presenters, Dr. Paul Hesberg and Dr. Susan Pritchard. Paul is a senior research ecologist with USDA Forest Service Research and Development, affiliate full professor at four Western US and Canadian universities, and the 2022 to 2024 president of the International Association for Fire Ecology. His research explores wildfire and climate change effects on landscape dynamics and the structure and organization of historical, current, and future landscape resilience. Paul is keenly interested in partnering with managers to advance the work of forest restoration and climate change adaptation and stronger science and management partnerships. Susan is a research scientist at the School of Environmental and Forest Sciences, where she studies fire ecology, landscape vegetation and fire dynamics, and fire and fuels management. We're pleased to have both Paul and Susan with us today, and with that, I'll turn it over to them. Um, Paul and I were scanning the list of participants today, and um, we just recognize so many of your names and appreciate um, spending the time with you. So I am going to share Paul's screen. And um, the way that we're going to um, organize our presentation today is I am going to introduce um, the Reburn um, project and provide some of the foundational um, background to Reburn. And then Paul will take over and share some of our exciting results. So without further ado, um, the two papers that we've written so far on Reburn um, are both um, in fire ecology, and we've been compiling a special issue that will be growing on um, the reburn model. So um, as I will detail in the next set of slides, um, we actually created the reburn model to envision a world where fire could run wild back on Western landscapes. And so our first model, um, first paper is on the methods. So how we constructed the reburn model. And then the second paper, led by our colleague um, Nick Povak is on system level, level feedbacks that um, we were able to really um, learn from within this modeling framework. So um, we have had the opportunity and also the burden of living in an area that's just been really severely impacted by recent wildfires. And so from 2000 to 2022, this is just one slice of North Central Washington State. Um, this is showing a burn severity atlas. And the colors here show um, unburned islands in gray, um, low severity areas in um, yellow, um, moderate severity in orange, and high severity in red. And I'll direct your attention to the west side of the screen. Um, a lot of our semi-arid mixed conifer forests are located in these areas, more of the central part, um, our more shrub step ecosystems. And you can just see from the color spectrum here that um, we've had a number of really game changer fires, large, what we would term mega fires, with a lot of patches of um, stand replacement. Um, with climate change, this is um, just a huge concern for our region because these fires are um, resetting the slate and forests are um, truly needing to recover from seeds often. So within that big mosaic of past fires uh, was one of the first large fire events um, that um, I studied. Um, Paul predate, predates me in this region a little bit um, by decades. But anyway, the Tripod fire um, burned in 2006 and um, in a uh, in an area just north of Winthrop, Washington, where I live. Um, I studied this fire. Um, I was pretty excited to actually, because it gave an opportunity to look at some of the really incredible work that the Meta Valley Ranger District um, had done on um, fuel treatments. And so those are um, highlighted in a kind of hatch mark. Um, they, they extend way beyond the tripod boundaries, but we've kind of buffered them into the southern part of the tripod. And um, my first studies were actually field studies to look at how um, different treatments fared in what was often a high severity fire. But another thing that um, Paul and I wanted to direct your attention to is, is that um, through this burned area reflectance classification, we're also able to see um, some of the impacts of previous fires. So you'll see 2003, there was a small Isabel fire here and the larger Farewell fire here. 
um, acted as near barriers to fire spread, as did the 2001 30 Mile Fire. 1994 Thunder Mountain Fire had some reburning, but um, you can see kind of green around the edges here. And then conspicuously, even the 1970 Forks Burn um, didn't really reburn. Um, and so we looked at that kind of early on as, wow, you know, some of these past fires were large but they made a big impact on the subsequent spread and severity of the tripod. Um, fire shadows ended up being kind of a big deal. So in the case of the forks burn right here, it wasn't just that there were different fuels that were less receptive to burning, but also a marked change in topography. We noted that in the Tenasket Ranger District, which starts over here too, that there were these mountain cirques that happened to be not in the um, uh, uh, windward side of slopes. And so they were leeward and tended to have a shadow effect with fire as well. And now moving into the treatments that I studied, um, some of this was using geospatial layers and just looking at past treatments and burn severity through um, image analysis. Um, and what we found through that was is that Treatments, whether they were past clear cuts that had been broadcast burned or past thins that had been underburned, um, the common element of which ones fared really well in the subsequent tripod fire, even 20 to sometimes 30 years following that treatment, was fire. So, where there had been a pretty efficient underburn or broadcast burn, um, we saw that the tripod fire basically kind of skipped it. And what that looks like, um, especially immediately post-fire, um, it's these conspicuous green islands that almost seem impossible when you're viewing them from across a drainage. But if you get up close, you'll start noticing that um, the reason why these treatment units didn't reburn is lack of fuel continuity on the surface. Yeah, there's green trees here, but they're kind of um, in a desert-like um, environment in terms of surface fuels. We studied how thinning and burning um, worked. And what we found is, again, that surface fuel element is so critical. So thin only units um, in general worked really well for reducing crown fire behavior, but they often burn so intensely because of that deferred fire, a lot of surface fuels and also some logging slash that um, tree survivorship was low. And so the thinning and prescribed burning units um, we're almost like magic, but we know that that's not magic anymore. And so um, study findings, just to summarize, um, field reduction treatments were spectacularly successful, whether they were past wildfires or past thinning and burns. Um, I just wanted to point out that in this unit, you can see down slope, the heat of the fire was coming into the unit from below. Some of this was um, actually crown fire behavior, dropped down when it hit the shelter wood and actually didn't reburn this unit. So um, these were data sets that were really foundational and inspirational to our reburn study. But the true inspiration was actually Paul asking me one day, did you know that within even just the perimeter of the tripod fire, there were over 300 active fire starts that were suppressed between the start of the North Cascade smoke dumper space in 1940 and when the tripod burned, and I was like, no, I did not know that. And um, the question then Paul posed was, what would the tripod have looked like if even a portion of those fires had been allowed to burn? And so that um, brought us, I'm looking at Paul right now, to <laughs> 10 years of active study of how in the hell do we actually do this modeling to kind of do this justice, like these what if scenarios. So. I'm comparing here the 1940 to 2005 ignitions on the left, um, which did enter into the um, simulations and then the actual burn severity in 2006 on the right. Okay, so one of the ways that we started approaching this and I wanna um, just give a huge shout out to our colleague, Brian Salter, who is the massive mind master of reburn is we needed to think through um, how do we actually assign fuels to start out with and then continue assigning fuels with this idea of modeling past fires and their interaction over time? 
Um, land fire fuel layers were super helpful. And so we started out with a land fire biophysical settings layer, which gave us basically a way to classify um, this kind of simulation landscape into ponderosa pine, Douglas fir, dry mixed forest types, as well as the cold mixed conifer forests that occur in higher elevations, which are dominated by Engelman spruce, subalpine fir, and lodgepole pine. Um, Brian went further and classified the landscape into aspect classes, as well as their topo position, in order to get a sense for which sites were actually much drier um, within the dry mix conifer located on south, southwesterly slopes, um, and which ones were moister. So these would be valley bottoms, as well as in north um, easterly slopes. Um, an elevation mask was also really important because within our modeling environment, and we're gonna spare some of the details today, we needed to be able to condition fuels at higher elevation to not burn as readily as the lower elevation fuels. And so we were also built into these pathway groups a sense that there are these higher elevation fuels that have a different season of burning. So now um, moving into our state Chandison models, so I just showed you a kind of a map that um, makes use of 30 meter pixels from land fire. Um, we actually then course into the grain of our base map into 90 meter pixels. And for every single pixel, we need to, to assign canopy and surface fuels for fire behavior modeling. And um, this involved a lot of sessions. It took us a long time to create this complicated diagram that we do not expect you to understand to start out with, but I'm going to step you through a few things. First of all, each box within the state transition model contains assignments of surface fire behavior models for Rothermel spread model, as well as canopy fuels that are um, used within our fire behavior modeling. And then I wanted to just talk through the structure of state transition models. So state 1A is post-fire bare ground after a high severity fire. And then this first row actually steps through forest development, stand initiation, stem exclusion, understory reinitiation, young forest multi-story, all the way to old forest multi-story. This is our fire exclusion pathway. We had a lot of data to actually populate a fire exclusion pathway just because that's what our legacy is on a lot of these landscapes. What got trickier, and I'm not going to have time to really get into, are imagining and actually doing some data um, manipulations to better understand how a mixed severity fire regime would interact over time to create um, these different scenarios. And so I'll step through one of them just to kind of um, help you think through some of our logic. So we could have a high severity fire event creating post-fire bare ground that actually had standing snags from the previous fire move over to state 2A, um, where fuels become receptive in the understory. If we have another high severity reburn, that puts us into a very different state. So state 1C starts us out on a reburn pathway in which that antecedent forest has actually burned up um, pretty much efficiently in that second fire. And we start out with a very depopulated um, fuel environment where Trees are able to establish slowly over time, but without that antecedent stand dropping down and having a lot of fuels. Um, we move then, I'll just say briefly here, into more of our savanna, where we've had so many repeat fires, especially low to moderate severity fires, that we don't have an old forest, um, old forest multi-story. Instead, we have an old forest single story with a lot of fires. So. Um, a lot more detail in our methods paper, um, but we actually um, had an incredible time putting together um, a state transition model with these dynamics of low, moderate, and high severity fire. Um, I'm just going to pop this up and say we needed to have a very different model that was a little less complicated um, up in the higher elevation um, subalpine fir, Engelman spruce, lodgepole pine forest. So now moving into our geospatial fire simulation model. This is a nice um, diagram that Brian Salter put us put together for us. And um, what I'm going to talk through is the logic behind our simulation model and how we actually 
think through having fires be able to burn every single year within our simulations over deep time, and then be able to update the fuels to represent those fires and then burn the next year. So starting with the first year, we basically use our um, base map. So where we were using the land fire biophysical settings to create a base map, that's our way to assign each pixel with um, a state transition model, whether it's a dry mixed conifer, a moist mixed conifer, cold font conifer system. So that's done here. We have a time step one. And then we move into just moving into one time step of fuels. So we take um, one year forward in our state transition model, update then the canopy and surface fuels to an input layer that is then able to be run within um, our fire behavior model. And we chose, um, which I'll get into in the next slide, um, FS Pro to run um, fire behavior. So basically we have this canopy and surface fuel layer ready to go. And then we have to ask the question, um, do we have a fire event that um, lands on receptive enough fuels and under weather conditions that allow it to burn? So if they, we do have a fire that is going to burn, then we run FS Pro through um, that fire. It runs through a terrain model, through these fuels, and generates a flame length surface map from that fire event. And so whatever pixels are then burned by the fire need to be updated. And so those pixels end up being um, not burnable throughout the fire season. If we have more than one fire, then this loop happens through these fires throughout the fire season. And then at the end of this, we need to then update our base map to represent burned and unburned pixels that then go through another time step and we move forward in time. So state transition models, sometimes you know they have these time steps where um, it looks like there's not a jump in fuels, but we actually, I'll just go back really quickly to this graph. We do have some ramps in here. So forests are growing throughout this time period. So there's not necessarily a big break here in our model. Okay, so um, the fire growth model, um, there's much more detail in our publication, but I wanted to mention that FS Pro is generally run as a simulation tool within um, the Wildland Fire Decision Support System. And it's run on probabilistic weather. But in our case of the tripod, we actually summarized actual historical weather so that we could um, seed in wind direction and space, speed and ERCs to actually um, emulate um, more of a historical run for these years that we modeled. Um, the command line version was really essential for us because we have it within a geospatial modeling workflow that I just showed um, that loops us in with ArcGIS Pro. Okay, um, you do not need to remember these tables, but I wanted to let you know that um, within this first paper, we daylight um, all of the surface fuel assignments that we have, as well as canopy fuel assignments for each state within our state and transition model. So these are just our lookup tables. Um, we also, I kind of glossed over this, but from flame length, we need to then take the flame length value for each pixel and translate it for forest type into a severity class. And so this um, table also um, provides that translation. So just daylighting some of the canopy fuels that um, are input into FS Pro. These include canopy cover, height, canopy base height, and canopy bulk density. Very nicely, um, we can also, based on our model outputs, um, map these values. So for every pixel within our reburn landscape, um, we have outputs that don't just give us the fire statistics, but also give us the post-fire states and therefore all these attributes. Another um, nice um, view of this um, is our fire behavior fuel model map. And so because each state is mapped at the pixel level, we can then show fire behavior fuel model assignments for pre-fire, um, but I'm also showing that um, here in a post-fire environment, we're seeing NB9 
in gray. It's a really nice way to actually show um, for that fire season where the new fires were. And um, you'll notice that there's a lot of fire on this landscape. This is a high fire, high fire probability landscape. And so um, being able to see these non vertebral pixels is really interesting, especially in relation to, to that forest. Um, so one final slide before I pass the baton to Paul is, is that within our state transition model, I also indicated that there's stand structural classes. So for, us, for the forested pixels, I wanted to describe, because this will be really important as Paul moves into the results, we have a color coding for kind of forest structural class um, slash age. This color coding is that where there is a recent fire and it's non-vegetated or it just happens to be like rock, it's black. And so you'll see some areas of this um, highly pixelated fired landscape as black. Um, stand initiation, so the really young forests are in pink. And then young forests also tend to be in pastels. So we have stem exclusion open canopy and stem exclusion closed canopy in yellow colors, understory reinitiation in light green. And then as we move into older forests, young forest multi-story is in dark green. And then old forest multi-story is in dark blue. And importantly, because we do find quite a bit of savanna in here, so the open forest Sing, old for single story is in turquoise, just to give a nice contrast. So um, don't expect you to remember these, but it is helpful to keep in mind as Paul moves into results that young forests tend to be more of a lighter pastel color, old forests a darker color, except for the turquoise. Right, Paul, I'm gonna move, move seats and hand it over to you. Sounds good. All right. Thanks for uh, teeing that up, Susan. So what I'm gonna do is talk about uh, what we learned from our reburn model and an awful lot of these results you can actually see in the second paper led by Nick Povak. And so what I'm showing here is a 3000 year simulation and I'll explain why we simulate so long. The first 300 years is essentially a burn-in period where we're allowing the landscape to grow up and to get those fire on vegetation interactions to start happening. And then as we continue the simulations in each of these pathway groups, you can see labeled dry, moist mixed conifer, cold moist conifer, and cold dry conifer. What I'm showing here is essentially the emergence of forest structural conditions as they vary with fire in each one of these pathway groups. To, but to really learn more, we have to zoom in a little bit. So I've got about a thousand years that I have expanded. And I just wanna show you how the dry mixed conifer with its more frequent fire, uh, even though the fires uh, are most numerous in the cold forest, availability to burn is highest in the dry and the moist mixed conifer, but you see that they're not burning the same way at all. And what I really want your eye to sort of uh, zoom into is that you can see when some of these intermediate uh, conditions like understory reinitiation and young multi-story, they start to accumulate. That tips the landscape into a more flammable condition because fuel ladders are more abundant. And then you'll see more of the charcoal color, which is post-fire bare ground, and then stand initiation structure emerge. This right here uh, is a movie to essentially show you how these dynamics are occurring. So shown are the states in each one of the pathway groups as they're varying over time. Here we drew maps every five years and added them to this movie. And you'll see the colorization for the states is identical to the colorization for the structural conditions. So you're essentially seeing how disturbances create structure and then the evolution of that structure over time. And this is simply box and whisker charts that are showing you over a 3000 year simulation what the uh, interquartile range is and what the whiskers are on those interquartile ranges for each one of the pathway groups. So one thing that you can really see is that the there's a lot of fire in this landscape and the landscape is dominated by an awful lot of uh, uh, young and uh, immature to maturing forest. In the cold forest, we find out very little old forest, multi-story or single story, because fires are so numerous, but we actually see quite a bit of old multi and single story, these park-like stands 
occurring in the dry mix conifer and the moist mix conifer. Here's a look at an expanded view of the cold moist and the cold dry conifer forest. And what I want you to really notice here is that these landscapes tip uh, when there is a superabundance, in this case of understory reinitiation, which is this lighter green and young multi-story. So the combination of these adds an awful lot of fuel ladders to the forest. And what you'll see is an awful lot of fires creating non-forest conditions that are subsequent barriers to fire flow. And notice how abundant these non-forest conditions are in the cold forest. This area has an awful lot of cold forest in it. And so we would typically see non-forest area vacillate between 30 and perhaps 60% of the landscape area. So essentially it's starting to tip us off that there's a tug of war between forest, which is a high potential energy state and non-forest where that potential energy is reduced to potentially the lowest level. All right, we developed a set of diagnostic tools and um, there'll be a test on this at the end. Um, but uh, honestly, what we're just basically showing you is that we can, we can barcode the fire regime of each pathway group. And I'm just gonna show you the dry uh, mixed conifer forest. So in one set of columns, we're showing how often, what proportion of the time pixels burned at very low to high severity. And then in the second set of columns, we're showing how often fire or just succession drove transitions from one state to the other. And remember, Susan told you earlier that instead of having a step function between states, we actually develop fuzzy ramps. So the canopy fuels are constantly evolving, uh, and that means their vulnerability over the transit time is also evolving. So this allows us to be able to say just how variable was the fire severity regime, what was dominant, and what was subordinate across the simulation horizons. All right. We had a really cool opportunity to compare some of our uh, simulation findings with uh, empirical data we had from the Columbia Basin uh, data set because we sampled quite heavily the Okanagan Highlands where this occurs. And we found two really cool things is that we can discover more old forest uh, in the simulations than the empirical reconstructions. So that would suggest that there's some measure of landscape synchronicity in our empirical reconstructions. The other thing that we can notice is understory invasions were already well underway. So here I'm basically showing the percent of the sampled area in the empirical reconstructions and how they relate to uh, the median 8% range, which is essentially 10% you know, tails on either side of the median observation. So we're seeing uh, seedlings, saplings, and poles in our simulation models uh, moving into the landscape uh, in ways that we could not see um, in the uh, uh, reburn simulations. And so it's essentially telling us that there was aging on our oldest historical uh, data sets and we can find that problem with the simulations. All right, this is, this is a, a kind of a simplified rendering of information that allows us to start understanding to some degree the simulation uh, dynamics of our landscape. So just to find your way around this diagram, uh, yellow, orange, and red refer to the proportion of fires in each one of the simulation years that is low, moderate, or high severity fire. Obviously the hotter colors are high severity. And then this dark brown trace is basically, is we call it the none trace. And that means the area without surface fuels where a fire has consumed them. And so it has to evolve from that day forward with no surface fuels. Uh, and then it accumulates them as grasses, shrubs, trees fall down, that sort of thing. Uh, FFE is this light green. We call that fire flow enablers. Once an area is recolonized by grasses, forbs, shrubs, that sort of thing, it now is able to carry fire. So all of those states where that's a true statement, those fall into the fire flow enabler and then crown fire potential, CFP right here. These are areas where you have essentially got um, fuel ladders and canopy bulk density that allows for crown fire initiation and spread. And so what's, what this is just really showing us is there's an awful lot across all these forest types of variable fire severity. The second thing is we're finding out that there's this tension between the development of forest 
on forest capable acres and uh, ignitions which are essentially burning uh, the well connected areas that have high crown fire potential. So you, this essentially is showing the landscape tipping repeatedly. Okay, and one of the really cool observations we found out is these light blue traces are areas where we have extreme fire weather. And what we're finding out is the landscape doesn't burn big every time there's an extreme fire weather year. Very often, the pattern uh, that exists in the landscape allows lesser fires and more benign years to nibble down those high vulnerability conditions into uh, lower vulnerability conditions. And so this basically tells us there's a tug of war between factors growing and taking away fire and the landscape can uh, requires a certain amount of these alternative stable states, non-force, if you will, in order to stay resilient. All right, this is a superposed epoch analysis, which is used really often in fire history studies, but we apply it here to two really important questions. To, to get your eyes tuned in, the pink blocks, those are fuel conditions in increasing abundance. So these are increases in fire fences, which we call the nun class, fire flow enablers, which are the fire corridors that are spreading fire, and then CFP, crown fire. And the blue blocks are essentially fuel conditions are in declining abundance. And this is basically telling us for two analyses, the first one is large area burned. Uh, what are the conditions under which large areas go big? And so it is essentially declining abundance of fire fences that we see that. Uh, we also see that increasing abundance of fire flow enablers, flashy fuels that spread fires are really important and crown fire potential increases in abundance as these things decline. So essentially those are the values that are being traded on the landscape. And then in the second analysis, we're asking the question, uh, what explains large area of high severity burned? And it's a similar set of things. Here we're showing declining abundance of fire fences again, increasing abundance of these uh, fire corridors, and then increasing abundance of uh, high crown fire potential conditions. So uh, what was fun about this is we can actually compare uh, analyses that we use in fire history studies with simulation studies that also give us fire history. This is a classification tree analysis where we're asking again, two simple questions. Uh, what are the main drivers of low fire activity in extreme fire weather years? And what are the drivers of high fire activity in non-extreme weather years? So uh, in the dark gray, this dark charcoal, these are low fire activity conditions. In the light gray here, these are high fire activity conditions. And the simple story here is that in both A and B, the number of ignition, so ignition density, right? There are hot spots on the landscape um, that is in uh, non-burnable and low flame length and low rate of spread states, which is none. They're the main drivers of fire activity. And this for us helps us stick the landing about how critical these none or uh, burned and recovering areas are to essentially establishing resilience on the landscape. And this kind of goes against what many of us learned about uh, where forests ought to be growing. If it's forest capable, we should park a patch of forest there. But what we're finding out is it very likely didn't work that way under an active fire regime. There's a lot of uh, area in alternative stable states that existed for a short time or a fairly long time in the overall landscape resilience picture. All right, some uh, findings that uh, come out of this overall set of work. What we're finding out is these systems that had intact active fire regimes, they, they were shifting all around in space and time within a range of conditions. So instead of all the data space being filled, there were actually clouds of conditions that seemed to represent how the landscape worked. We found out that our model was able to reproduce the empirically uh, reconstructed conditions that we did in the Columbia Basin Assessment, but we actually learned more from the modeling in addition as a result of some of the things we could simulate, but we couldn't empirically reconstruct from our aerial photo data sets. We find that ignition locations and fire fences 
uh, which are the nun conditions, they provide strong spatial and temporal controls on fire size and severity. And so an awful lot of area that's burned and recovering, as you can see in the photo on the right, is critical for the rest of the forest to be forest. Another thing we learned is that large fires are not unique, they're integral to the system. And we found out through simulation methods that they derive from fairly middling conditions. And by that, I mean uh, conditions in the interquartile range where it's unique configurations that produce high contagion of things like high crown fire potential that actually lead to big fires. It's actually not highly unique, uh, contagious high crown fire petition. Uh, conditions. They come out of average conditions. Second thing we learned from this, and we predicted this in our uh, Landscape Ecology of Fire book chapter, is that small fires regulate the frequency and size uh, of larger events. So if you think of a fire size distribution, fire sizes, uh, there's numerous small and medium sized fires and far fewer of the large events and the small events are what are regulating the frequency of the largest fires. Second thing we found out um, is, that, and this uh, encourages to believe we're on the right beam, is that these non-forest elements are actually a key to the stability of ecosystems, essentially that resonant structure within a range of conditions for each climate condition that you have. And what we see typically is 35 to 50% of resilient landscapes are in this non-forest condition 40% seems to be a good average across long simulation times. We've gone on with this work to be able to say, okay, what are some fire management scenarios we might stress test to see what kinds of conditions emerge? We tried four uh, scenarios that we'll present in this particular work. The first of them is where there are no fires at all. That's a highly successful suppression program. Modern suppression is where only the worst 2% of fires escape. So these are defined in simulations as those where the fire weather conditions are in the 98th or greater percentile. Partial suppression means that managed wildfires are allowed in uh, late summer and fall seasons and the worst 2% of fires still are allowed to escape and then no suppression. This is essentially what does an active fire regime look like where there's no suppression going on. And so you can see here, these are maps that we just drew at random that are representative realizations. This is essentially what tripod looked like after a long period of fire exclusion. And this is what would happen if we continued uh, putting out as many fires as we could and the worst 2% continue to burn. This is with some managed wildfire happening, contrasting it with uh, an active fire regime where suppression isn't large. All right, some future directions. We're moving into climate change now. We've developed methods to downscale climates and ask the question, how does this landscape work with an active fire regime or with suppression? When you warm up the temperatures, you dry out the landscape. And then one of the key things we wanna know because we see non-forest as a stabilizer, how much non-forest is gonna occur in each of these forest types under climate change? We're gonna to continue to ask the question about what happens in this tug of war between factors growing and burning forest under climate change. And one of the reasons why this feels like an important question to us is that reburning does a really cool thing to forest landscapes. The first fire kills some trees. It can be of any severity. And the second fire is gonna consume that dead wood that falls. And so a decoupling begins to happen with a reburn ecology where the surface fuels are decoupled from the canopy fuels. And what we're finding out, you can read about this in the POVAC paper, is you can store more forest on a landscape uh, where you've got a reburn ecology because a fair amount of the landscape, sometimes up to a third of the landscape is in this decoupled state. So, so these are forest canopies that are now difficult to burn because you don't have that connectivity between the surface and the canopy fuels. The other question we're gonna ask, and this comes from some of our Canadian work right now where there's a lot of cold forest in British Columbia and aspen and birch are free to grow there. We wanna basically say how much of the landscape under climate change converts to this hardwood or mixed wood condition. And one of the reasons why is many of our hardwood species are actually uh, pop up early in the sear after disturbance. And so fire frequency and reburn ecology is uh, 
is more complicated, more frequently occurring. What's the role of hardwoods when that happens? The other thing that we're uh, asking is because we can translate these four structural conditions into habitat conditions, how are there changes uh, in habitat conditions as the, the changes in the active fire regime are occurring? How are habitats networked under a reburn ecology? And then um, we're also asking the question because uh, Susan's lab has developed the ability for us to be able to translate our states into carbon storage states. What kind of carbon can you actually store in a resilient landscape in the 20th century climate and in the future climate going forward? So here's a first peek at uh, what that looks like where Susan has gone and reclassified those states under the four different management scenarios that I showed you early. And what I wanna draw your attention to is that in an active fire regime, this is the amount of carbon that was typical in the landscape simulations that we've done, contrasting it with the other four management scenarios. And we see almost 50 to 60% more carbon stored in the no fire scenario versus the active fire regime scenario. So we have some opportunities with a bag, a mixed bag of tools to potentially conserve more carbon than in the active fire regime, but the kind of carbon that was stored in our tripod landscape was more likely this kind of condition than this kind of condition. Finally, uh, we're starting some work with some wildlife colleagues right now uh, in lynx and snowshoe habitat, snowshoe hare habitat. Uh, this area on the left is uh, where you can see the tripod landscape is what it looks like under an active fire regime. On the right, this is the landscape that the lynx and hare were making a living in before the tripod landscape burn. And so what we're doing right now is translating structural conditions to lynx and snowshoe hare uh, habitat and asking the question under historical climate, what kind of abundance did we have? And as we do the climate change work, we're gonna re-ask the question, what do lynx and hare have to look forward to in the future? All right, uh, that, uh, that ends my comments. And um, I think we've got good time for questions, yeah? We sure do. Thank you so much for that excellent presentation. You guys covered an awful lot. And um, I did post both of the papers in the chat if folks want to go back and read both of those because there's a lot more than what was covered today. Um, so seeing as you kind of ended your talk on um, old growth and where that might stand in the future, uh, we'll start out with Robin's question asking, with the policy attention on mature and old growth, how does this modeling inform the desire to have a persistent and durable network of old growth? Can you start? Mm -hmm. It's a really great question, Meg. Um, so one of the things that we're finding out is there are some terrains where we have fire shadows. So these would be in the fire refugia parlance, places that uh, more often than not are skipped by fire. And so we see that some of the refugial populations, depending upon the terrains, are gonna be really critical to anchor old growth in and network off of. But we're finding out with the rest of the landscape, you could sort of map it into sort of always, sometimes, and never old growth. There are a variety of places that just simply have so much fire, they never get old. They're in those sort of young and intermediate age forest structures. And so, uh, and under climate change, uh, we're doing the climate change work in BC, and we're going to translate that soon to the tripod area. But what we're seeing in British Columbia is the frequency of hardwoods goes up under climate change. Uh, there's more burned area, there's more non-forest under climate change. And so our suspicion is that we're going to have to cooperate with essentially how fire works on that landscape. And the, the full suppression situation, we feel is going to probably be in significant trouble under climate change. It's one of the reasons why we're going into the climate change work next in the tripod landscape, because we believe that moving transitioning the landscape is gonna ultimately be a better move for having more old growth on the landscape, but it's mostly gonna be dynamically emergent on the landscape, not a fixed position. Susan? Yeah, I was just gonna add that one of the things, we took out a slide um, for the methods just to tighten our talk. And um, I forgot to add that the way that we actually uh, model ignitions in the tripod landscape is through lightning probability maps. 
a big surprise for me was just how much the high elevations in the tripod are pounded by lightning. And so even though when I first moved to the Meadow Valley in 2004, I witnessed a tripod landscape before that fire that was um, just full of mature and old growth forest. It was. Um, that area is unsustainable as such when we think about how much lightning is actually pummeling that landscape. And so um, in terms of sustaining old and mature forest, one of the big surprises for me was seeing how reburn landscapes end up being dominated by fire edge environments. So the idea that fires die often in the um, perimeter of old fires, that gives forests a, a, a way to survive. And um, so in our modeling, we're seeing a lot more kind of almost savanna, even in the higher elevations, which I wasn't prepared to kind of see until we learned from the reburn model um, that that was probably likely given how many ignitions are up there. Robin, part of your question about how much mature and old and how do we network it seems to be tied to another effect we're seeing in the reburn model. And that is our notion of patches, a patchwork mm -hmm. having stair step edges. It cannot be found in the active fire regime, the active fire ecology. What we see instead is fuzzy boundaries between mm -hmm. all the patches where fires ramp down and they ramp up over a gradient of conditions that can be 100 to two, 300 meters wide. And when you add up the area over space and time that's in fuzzy boundaries, it's a huge contribution to the durability of the landscape. So in a way, the way we think about patches is a little off-putting as well. It's, it's not the way patches uh, boundaries occur in, a, in the native fire regime, either in the BC landscape or in our tripod landscape. All right, um, I can already see that we're not gonna have enough time to get to all of the questions that I would love to, but um, moving on to the next one, Travis asked, given the importance of non-forest, you know, that 30 to 40% in your results, do current management plans in this area identify non-forest desired conditions as a component? And if not, is this a potential recommendation from your work to managers who are working in these landscapes? We can give you a short answer to that one. Um, in On the Okanagan and Wenatchee, non-forest as a physiognomic condition is a critical part of the map. And we're using climatic water deficit and AET measurements to, to determine where the forest types are changing and where the trailing edge ecotones are. And those are likely areas to create transition to sparse woodland and non-forest conditions. All right, so kind of staying on that trend of non-forest landscapes, uh, Lisa asked, how well do you think this model might work in other vegetation types, such as non ecosystems? Um, and Lisa is particularly interested in sagebrush. And if this model doesn't translate, do you know of other research that might apply well in those landscapes? Uh, that's a really interesting question. Um, I'd have to think about it some more. Um, one of the reasons why I think that this model could translate into shrub step environment sagebrush is, is that um, we can do a pretty good job in terms of live fuel availability versus dead fuel. And so there's a time where sagebrush is not receptive to burning and then there's a time where it is. And that contrasts very much with, I mean, it's preaching to the choir here, but cheatgrass. And so, I could see that a model could be built for shrub step that would be really informative, especially thinking through invaded states versus more native shrubs and then some management scenarios. So at least one additional uh, consideration mm -hmm. that we uh, that we're working with, and that is the inavailability across gradients to be able to condition and cure fuels over space and time. It's one of the, the drawbacks of almost all of the simulation architectures right now. Uh, and if you stop and think about it, an awful lot of these fine fuels, they, they dry fast and they also re-wet when uh, relative humidity occurs. And I think that would be a real key thing that we'd have to get much better at uh, than we are right now. Great, excited to see where that goes with your future research as well. 
Um, so Meg is interested to hear how this information could relate to discussions regarding the need to treat burned areas to prevent reburns that could shift fire regimes or create undesirable soil impacts, especially given current trends toward higher severity fires. Meg, I was super excited to see you on, and um, it's, I know you know this, but um, like the tripod right now, as is, is kind of setting up for a really high severity reburn um, in areas. We saw a little bit of that in 2021 Cub Creek 2 fire. Um, the fuels are getting more receptive, and I would say that those fire effects were not um, dire. But as we have more and more logical pine regeneration amidst a sea of really fire excluded forests that are now dropping down. Um, I'm pretty concerned about what that means in terms of impacts to soil. Those are high duration, long duration fires. And so um, it would be exciting to learn from others who are also on like Jane Park about the idea of getting in and doing some offer op um, opportunistic um, high severity fires under milder conditions to start taking down some of that coarse wood under conditions that we can live with rather than waiting for the next tripod fire to start building up. Did you want to add to that? No, that's really great. I, the only thing I would add would, would be that the opportunity really is to sort of bulk down that fuel dropping problem in stages so that you don't have the kind of accumulations that are, what are we, 17, 18 years later, we mm -hmm. kind of missed the prime window and the tripod landscape, but we still need to go in and burn the burn in order to be able to have not only forest hang around and not in a severe reburn, but continually to think about the post-fire environment is where we can reduce those fuels for the next burns. And we need to do that in small dollops so they don't go big even when we prescribe burn them. And I appreciate how that question um, touches back to Travis's question as well about, you know, what kind of manager recommendations can we make out of research? Um, yeah, go ahead, Susan. I'll just say that I mentioned Jane Park because Jane and colleagues up in Parks Canada are just doing um, some bold and really necessary um, landscape burns that are meant to be operational crown fires. Um, in post tripod, and there's also a lot of post other fires within this north central Washington landscape, um, we are racing a clock on um, lodgepole pine, um, establishing really densely almost everywhere up in the high country and um, becoming a viable seed source. So in terms of a management recommendation, um, it would be excellent to start seeing fire managers come in and uh, start building intentionally the small to medium sized fires that then um, create a more resilient landscape that's not all poised to burn at once. We didn't just have the tripod fire, we've had fire after fire that effectively, these fires are coming up so similarly in age that a very large landscape could synchronistically be ready to burn at once. Also on that uh, post-fire riff, uh, Andrew Larson in 22, led a really cool paper on some post-fire principles. How do you read a post-fire landscape and, and uh, assign the kinds of post-fire treatments that are really gonna give that landscape a hand down. And then Derek Churchill led a paper also in 22 where he basically applies those principles to four landscapes and shows how you can use different ways of diagnosis to determine what the best treatments are after a fire. All right, thank you. So we have just a couple of minutes left. We're gonna hit on a couple more questions and I've um, posted both of your emails in the chat for folks who want to continue to reach out, get involved, get involved with your research. Um, so Rochelle had a question that touches on something I was curious about as well, which is that Susan, you mentioned earlier that um, this model used a lightning ignition probability layer um, to evaluate where potential emissions were going to start, um, which doesn't necessarily take into account anthropogenic fire starts, um, both as we see them as a pattern um, around highly populated areas, and then also as Rich, uh, Rochelle mentioned, um, the long history and contemporary resurgence of cultural burning. Um, so 
how might this model or future models take uh, human vi started fires into consideration? Take it. Hear that? Okay. Um, really excited for this question. Yes, we've given it a lot of consideration. So um, oral history um, notes that um, Meta people um, regularly um, started fires on their way out of the high country. And so um, ignoring cultural ignitions is at our peril. So um, we decided that um, to calibrate the model, um, it was, we wanted to make sure that we had um, a system that was um, something that we could go back to in terms of lightning probabilities to start out with, but we're pretty excited to explore amplified ignitions that would be really realistic um, to think about historical cultural ignitions. We're never gonna have the correct number, but I think we can do it through some scenarios and it's definitely on our list to do. We, uh, we've got a project going in Northern California with the uh, Karuk and the Iraq and uh, where we're actually building a cultural fire regime model. So we'll take lightning and cultural ignitions and we're trying to find out what that fire regime looked like when we blend those. And so stay tuned. We'll be uh, reporting out on that probably in the next two, two and a half years. All righty, sounds great. So we're up against the top of the hour here. Um, if you guys wanted to touch on it, Alex did have a question about uh, downloading some files. Um, <clears throat> that Alex, you maybe, That you yeah. can respond to in the chat. Sure. Um, I'll just quickly say, Alex, we need to update our website and duly noted. Yeah. yeah, so so ping us, Alex. We've got all that stuff on another site. And we can download it. We're just, we're behind the eight ball and we'll get it done. All right. Um, I did want to take the opportunity to thank you both so much for coming back and doing another presentation with the Southwest Fire Science Consortium. Um, thank you to everyone who logged on today to listen into the presentation. And I look forward to having you back again um, when some of this uh, future research that we've been talking about comes out. So thank you thank so much. Thanks, everyone. everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for having us on, Rachel. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye.